You're live. We'd like to welcome everyone to this very important workshop uh, during the Noble uh, Convention, the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. I'm Dr. Benjamin F. Chavis, Jr., President and CEO of the National Newspaper Publishers Association. I'm the moderator uh, for today's panel. Uh, we are a strong supporter of Noble and very pleased that we're gonna have this important panel on reimagining public safety, new policies, new practices. Uh, of course, this workshop and the convention itself would not be possible without the strong support of our sponsors and our supporters. And I wanna hear an initial word uh, from our sponsors of Noble. First, uh, from Reynolds American, Shauna Williams. Hello, I'm Shauna Williams. I'm the Senior Manager of State and Local Government Relations for Reynolds American. One of my favorite excerpts from Splendid Literarium, on either side of a potentially violent conflict, an opportunity exists to exercise compassion and diminish fear based on recognition of each other's humanity. Without such recognition, fear fueled by uninformed assumptions, cultural prejudice, description, excuse me, desperation to meet basic human needs, or the panicked uncertainty of the moment explodes into violence which is my heroes are those who risk their lives every day to protect our world and make it a better place. Reynolds is excited to partner with National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Professionals in its 45th Union Conference. We congratulate you for 45 years as the conscience of law enforcement by being committed to justice by action. We are proud to co-sponsor this year's Noble 45th Anniversary Training Conference and to elevate your mission to ensure equality in the administration of justice and the provision of public service to all communities. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, uh, Shana, and give our best regards to all of our colleagues at uh, Reynolds America. Thank, Thank you for your leadership. Thank you. For 45 years, no, but this is a long time. We're pleased uh, to be here to support the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. We'll now have uh, two short video clips from our other sponsors of today's convention. Hello, my name is Sven Berkman. I'm with the Partnership for Safe Medicines. Counterfeit medicines and especially counterfeit medicines made with controlled substances will continue to be a significant challenge for law enforcement. Counterfeit pills made with fentanyl are already a driver of overdose death in the United States. The DEA in 2020 had already warned that this will be an issue and now seeing overdose death rates of 93,000 reported by the CDC, these worst fears have been materialized. It is an important issue as we see hundreds of thousands of pills and millions of pills being trafficked across the southern border into the United States and then distributed throughout all 50 states. But the criminals do not stop there. We're starting to see new forms of counterfeit medicines made with controlled substances. Most recently, counterfeit Adderall made with meth. These pills started to appear last year in seven states and have already now grown to a distribution in 18 states reported by law enforcement. This shows that these criminals will not stop to take advantage of the United States and our citizens with these dangerous counterfeit medicines. These criminal operations are not only involved in counterfeit medicines, but also drug trafficking, gun trafficking, money laundering, and as mentioned, it does drive the overdose death rate. We are from the Partnership for Safe Medicines are here to support law enforcement in this important challenge. And as you face this, to protect your communities. We look forward to partnering with you on this important challenge. Well, we thank the Partnership for Safe Medicines and we'll go to our next uh, sponsor.
I believe there's a short video from our next sponsor. BB&T and SunTrust are now truest, together for better. All right, well, we thank uh, Truist for that uh, short uh, clip. They're one of the other sponsors of today's convention and of today's workshop. There are several um, distinguished law enforcement executives who will be joining us for this uh, important panel entitled Reimagining Public Safety, New Policies, New Practices. And um, we're very pleased first to have uh, Sheriff Craig Owens from the Cobb County Sheriff's Office in Georgia. Uh, Sheriff Owens, thank you for joining us. Well, good morning, Dr. And thank you for having me on this morning. And we'll be later joined by um, the Chief of Police of Phoenix, uh, Chief Jerry Williams. She's having, as the Chief of Police, Chief of Police always have contingencies. So she says she'll be joining us in a few minutes, but I just want to recognize she will also be on the panel. And then we will also have uh, Daniel Isom, who's the Director of Public Safety in the great city of St. Louis. Uh, Director Isom, are you on yet? Yes, I am. Very good. Thank, thank you for joining us, man. Thank you. Uh, good to be here. So uh, I want to get right into it. Um, you know, um, law enforcement is facing a lot of uh, challenges, a lot of questions, but I just want to say how I think it's important to have African Americans in leadership positions in various law enforcement agencies around the country. And um, that's what we are going to talk about on this particular panel. And so while we're waiting for uh, Chief of Police Williams, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, first, I would like to ask uh, Sheriff Owens, uh, what do you think about some of the policing policies, just overall? And I know there are many different policing policies, but, but since George Floyd uh, situation in Minneapolis, uh, not only with the murder, but with the trial, the conviction, the sentencing, uh, people are raising questions about uh, policing. Uh, do you feel that uh, policing policies need to be reformed? Are they broken so that we have to have an overall reformation uh, of the criminal justice system, but particularly with policing policies? Well, that's, a, that's an excellent question to start out with this morning. I really believe that police organizations and sheriff's officers across the United States really need to look at and adapt their policies to prepare for the future. Because sometimes these policies that we have are so outdated and has been updated in, in recent time, which is causing us to act mm -hmm. off of old policies, which is not good policing methods. You know, law enforcement as a whole you've been very slow to recognize uh, where changes need to be implemented into our policies. So we need to act upon those things now and revisit our policies and procedures, make sure they're meeting industry standards for today and making sure that they're actually practicing those policies and procedures that we put in place as well. So yes, I think there is a, a need for us to go into really look at our policy procedures and fix a lot of them that's been broken. And we have to just do that transformation and start at the top of this policy procedure. So I, I agree 100% with that question. We have to. Very good. Uh, Director Isom, um, from your perspective there in St. Louis, do you believe that overall policing policies and practices need to be reformed or transformed, changed? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, we've seen over the course of the last five years that um, there has been a, a community outcry for uh, transformation. And there is an expectation in our community um, that policing transform and perform a different role than we have traditionally thought of police departments performing. And so I think um, it's good for law enforcement and the criminal justice system to have self-reflection 
Um, but also that reflection must come with the insight of the community in which they serve. And so, you know, looking at the hiring process, who are we selecting and why are we selecting them? Um, looking at how officers are socialized into the profession, uh, meaning uh, the police academy, field training, and other types of entries into the profession. And then uh, certainly the policies in terms of operations we need to look at. And, and finally, uh, the part that has always been a sticking point who, and, uh, is the oversight, um, having community involvement and oversight. And so I think we look at all those aspects and work through um, the community to find out what is the new direction. Very good. Uh, um, uh, just a follow-up question to this first uh, major question. Um, I'm going back to Sheriff uh, Orange. You know, how important it is to have African Americans in leadership where these policies and uh, practices are not only uh, developed but implemented. In other words, I know with this is the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. Uh, we've seen over the year of increase of brothers and sisters in uh, executive leadership position in law enforcement across the country. But I do want you to just on the record to say from your perspective, how important it is to have diversity, equity, and inclusion at the top leadership of law enforcement. Uh, Sheriff Owens? Yeah, I think it's extremely important. And coming from my perspective, being the first African-American sheriff ever elected in Cobb County, Georgia, uh, it is just a tremendous thing for young black men and women to see that another black person can be successful in, in law enforcement and make it to the top position. So it gives our people um, who might have not had that hope of achieving this position, mm -hmm. let them know that it's achievable. But it also on the policy side, and now it gives us the opportunity to go in and be the policy makers versus always being the one who's just following policy. Now we got a voice at the table. We go in and make decisions and change policy is gonna be you know, a good reflective of our community which we serve. So I think it's important on both levels. Uh, so great question. Very good. And uh, Director Isom in um, Missouri and certain there in uh, St. Louis, I know just have a new mayor there in St. Louis, but talk to us how important it's about uh, African Americans being at the top decision-making position in law enforcement. Yeah, I, it, of course, it's extremely important uh, that we have that type of diversity in our uh, leadership structure um, we all have different life experiences, especially in uh, communities of color and urban communities, which um, may be pre predominantly uh, of color. Uh, those are experiences that need to be um, valued and shape policy. Uh, and so I, I think it's extremely important to have uh, both leadership at the top, but throughout the police department and middle management and first line supervision as well as those practices and policies are put into place. Very good, Th thank you so much. Uh, there's a national outcry to transform policing in the United States. Can you identify at least one area that you think should be changed to improve policing practices? Sheriff Owens, I'll come back to you first. Okay, uh, I think I'm more, I got more than one answer on this because it kind of, both of these in my opinion kind of go together. So I think okay, my sure. first, my first person would be transparency. I think what's happening now throughout the United States, a lot of our citizens don't believe that we are being transparent in how we do business. We're not producing information in time in a timely manner. No, no, we're being truthful. So I think by being more transparent is, is one. Two, training. I think training is one of the most important things that any police officer or sheriff deputy can have. You know, so we, we consider this to be a profession. So to be a professional in this profession, you have to have proper education and training to be successful in it. So therefore, I think training is, is central. So we got to get back in and making sure all our deputies and police officers are receiving the proper training, getting higher education, working toward their uh, educational platform for whether it's going to be an undergrad degree, master's degree, et cetera, and get professionals in this profession that we call policing. All right. Um, Director Isom, um, can you identify one or two top things that you think need to be changed? I think um, the top thing that needs to be changed, and it is the focus of uh, Mayor Tashar Jones's administration, is to build a public safety response infrastructure that does not rely on law enforcement to address issues. Um, so 
uh, social workers that can respond a 24 hour, seven days a week, youth outreach workers that can respond 24 seven, uh, seven days a week, uh, looking at mental health uh, options and facilities for um, you know, uh, drug abuse, alcohol abuse. We, we need to build that infrastructure so we don't rely on the police to deal with uh, mental health, social service issues and we can move those issues to where they are more properly um, dealt with uh, over time and then leave policing uh, to uh, the real issues that police need to address um, serious crimes. Exactly. Uh, um, thank you, Rob. Those are two great answers uh, to this question. And, but it also opens the door to just a, a short subsequent question. Um, police departments across the country and law enforcement agents, of course, are increasingly, they're getting more and more added to their plate to do, uh, like mental health. Sometimes they expect police officers to be social workers. Um, what's your opinion when these public policies are implemented either by the city council, the county commissioner, or the state legislature, or even the federal government? A lot of times policies are passed and then they're handed on to law enforcement uh, to uh, impact. For example, in some municipalities, uh, they have a ban on uh, menthol cigarettes. And everybody knows that African-Americans disproportionately smoke uh, menthol. Uh, how, how do you respond when you are called to do things that are not necessarily uh, law enforcement? Uh, <laughs> Sheriff Warren? That's a good question. You know, sometimes yeah, we consider those things that it's, it's, it's legal, but it can be offered at the same time. Right, unintended uh, we, we, consequences. You're talking about absolutely. people have good, good intentions, but bad consequences. Right, exactly. So it sometimes puts us in a very tough predicament trying to deal with that, because we know what we think morally is the right thing to do, but we also go with the law is what yes. we work on. Exactly what the law says is what we have to buy by. So it really puts the law enforcement in a bad spot sometimes doing those things. But I think overall, uh, as I just give you a perspective from, from Cobb County, is our mental health crisis. Uh, it's starting to become too much in the state of Georgia and specifically in the metro Atlanta area. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, individuals have mental health issues and they're closed down to mental health facilities throughout the state. And so there's not a lot of um, out, outlets that are going to get proper treatment or care they need. So what happened when they act out, someone calls the police, they get arrested. But most of them have issues from not being on the medications or something spiking, causing them to act out versus getting them to the treatment center, they arrested, uh, arrested that individual and bring them to the jail. And so, and so that brings another part problem for us to deal with a mental health patient, which is a lot of times we're not, we're not trained for. That's not our specialty. So, okay. so that's, that creates problems for us here in Georgia. So mental health is a big thing. We got to reopen facilities to get proper um, treatment for these individuals because jail is not the place for them to be. You know, they're not going to get better. I can honestly probably say they'll probably get worse because yes. we're not those professionals in the area. So we got to really focus on that. In my opinion, reopening treatment centers, at least in Georgia, open those uh, hospitals back up and get them into the place so they can go and get help. So it, it puts us in a hard place sometimes trying to deal with those uh, circumstances. Right. Um, would you think it would be helpful, Sheriff, if the, these uh, lawmaking bodies, the state legislature or the city council, county committee, or even federal government, they should get more testimony from law enforcement personnel before they uh, pass these laws, because at the end of the day, you, uh, you're going to wind up having to enforce the law. Uh, right. But I, I just think that having your uh, unique perspective uh, of having to implement these laws and enforce these laws, particularly when it comes to uh, people of color communities, sometimes these things are disproportionately impacting us because of all the pre-existing conditions in our community, like poverty and economic inequity. You know, it's the, long, the list is long. Right. Yeah, I agree. I think having that partnership with your local uh, politicians and legislators are, are critical for us. And specifically for me, being an elected official myself, to have the open and frank dialogue with them, let them know what we really need to be successful uh, in the metro Atlanta area in Cobb County in particular. So yes, that is extremely important. Thank you. And, and Director Isom, I know that uh, all around the country, people are celebrating the way that uh, St. Louis seems to be heading now with your new municipal leadership. But can you just comment about the importance of law enforcement being involved 
uh, before these policies get implemented to make sure that the unintended consequences uh, are not negative. Uh, sometimes people, like I say, with good intentions, but have negative uh, disastrous uh, impact on particularly uh, uh, the black community. I agree. I, I think it's important that um, we're very transparent about what's on our plate and what yeah. we can handle as law enforcement. I think in many ways, uh, we're not transparent and honest about our capacity uh, to do certain things. And so I think uh, letting uh, legislators and um, political officials know that these are our public safety enforcement priorities and that um, even if those laws are passed, our capacity to enforce them. Is and uh, to your point, we have to look at the, the, the impact on black and brown communities. Uh, certainly these low level offenses are going to have greater impact on um, people of color uh, yes. and marginalized people. And in effect, they will clog up the system for those who we really need to address. So I think it's really being honest about uh, the capacity of the justice system uh, to deal with certain issues and the impact it might have on communities of color. Very good, thank you. Uh, next is um, what role should the federal government play in improving policing outcomes for communities of color in the United States? I know there's a bill uh, before Congress right now, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, uh, but what's your feeling uh, in terms of federal uh, public policy making? Uh, let's start with uh, Sheriff Owens. Yeah, you know, there is a role. I think the federal government has a, a place in, in, in improving the outcome of policing. But I found it to be more impactful when you have um, direct involvement with your local and state uh, officials first making those things, trying to do what's right there. But the federal government does have a role, just like the, the bill they're trying to pass in the Scott's bill on George Floyd Act. That is a way they can help you know, reshape and reform how we police the United States of America. Those are ways that can help. But I really truly believe that the state and local, uh, it should be the primary in, in crafting some of the things or have input. You know, we need to have legislators, law enforcement, and the community also in the room to have their voice and we're making some of these decisions well. And I think that's going to, only way we're going to bridge that gap between us and, and our partnership in our community. Very good. Uh, I think, did I see Chief Williams? Chief Williams? So sorry about that. Sorry about that. Uh, that had a little bit of trouble loading on. Good morning, that, everybody. Good morning, good Chief. Morning. And, uh, don't worry, we're just uh, getting started. And uh, we made note that uh, all chiefs of police are busy, so we knew that you were taking care of matters. We're glad to have you join us. And uh, we, we appreciate your leadership in the great city of Phoenix. I've uh, been to Phoenix many times. In fact, I'll be there shortly in a couple of weeks again. But um, I, I've been talking to uh, Sheriff Owens from Cobb County, Georgia, and from Director Isom uh, from the city of St. Louis. And what we're discussing right now, uh, Chief, is um, we asked the question, does the federal government have a role in helping to uh, improve uh, law enforcement across the country, uh, particularly the George Floyd uh, Justice and Policing Act? And we want to get your perspective uh, as Chief of Police of Phoenix. Uh, what, what do you see the role of the federal government? So, so the role of the, of the federal government can be seen as a central repository so that all law enforcement agencies have one stop in one location. Uh, the federal government can give us funding. The federal government can create uh, best practices that they can share with others. Um, I, I think for everyone who's on the panel or on this Zoom, we think of large cities, there are about 72, 73 of us in the, in the country, but there are 22, 22 18,000 police departments that are small, so we have to figure out that continental divide. And if the federal government can come up with a balancing act for all of us so that those of us who are well-funded can help and assist those that aren't in our areas, I think that would be a great way to start, but definitely a central repository for misconduct a central repository for best practices and use of force or response to resistance. I think that's the federal government's role, um, as well as giving us funding to help us get better. <laughs> Very good. Um, Director Isom, um, what's your perspective from the city of St. Louis about the role of the federal government? 
you know, I, I agree that most of the work needs to be uh, done on the local and state level because there are so many different police departments throughout the United States. But I do feel that um, the federal government can uh, establish um, consistent guidelines and procedures across the United States and leverage um, funding uh, to have state and local municipalities adopt uh, those standards. I also think that um, monies can be, be directed towards uh, training for law enforcement agencies. Um, as the chief indicated, there are very there are a lot of small agencies throughout the United States, and they don't have the capacity to do thorough, comprehensive training on a regular basis. So, the federal government can play a major role in providing free training and technical assistance to those uh, organizations. Very good, very good. Um, while we're discussing uh, these uh, federal policies, uh, as you know, um, the Congressional Black Caucus is also diverse. Um, Congressman Clyburn, who's uh, one of the highest ranking African-Americans in the Congress, uh, he opposes uh, this call for defunding the police. And yet there are some of the younger members of the Congressional Black Caucus who not necessarily asking that the police be defunded, but have raised the issue uh, as a part of the Black Lives Matter movement. I want to go back to uh, Sheriff Owens. Sheriff, uh, in Georgia, uh, do you think the police are getting adequate funding? And um, I already know the answer to the question about defund the police. That's not something that you would support. But I'm, I wanted to know, make sure that your uh, jurisdiction is getting adequate funding. Do you think you're getting adequate funding, Sheriff Owens? Well, I, I need to speak for my, my particular agency. Sure. Um, our agency in Cobb County has a lot of support for the community from our board commission, et cetera. And, and normally when I ask for something as a sheriff, I normally get the funding piece I ask for. Um, so we have a, a great um, relationship on funding with our BOCs. So, I normally get what I ask for as long as it's within reason, of course. So we don't have that issue. In my county, um, uh, Cobb County is a very diverse county, if you're not familiar with it. It's outside the metro Atlanta area of uh, Atlanta. It's one of the uh, largest counties in the state as well. Uh, it's used to, uh, a couple of years ago, we were the third wealthiest county in the state of Georgia. So uh, for funding for, for our particular agency, it's not an a issue currently. Uh, for some other agencies, I, it, it can and will be issues for them. Um, so currently, I think we're doing fine, but other agencies may be struggling. Maybe. All right, thank you. Uh, Chief Williams in Phoenix, uh, are you getting adequate funding? So that, that's a loaded question, Dr. James. I know, <laughs> I know. Loaded. This is, this uh, is just a discussion, no, no right. trick questions. I, so I just want to give you an opportunity to voice from your perspective. Right. So, so fortunately for us in the city of Phoenix, even in the wake of quite a few folks uh, who are some of our policymakers wanting to defund us, we recognize our policymakers and the mayor realize that we have to properly fund the police department. And, and, and I'm, you know, I'm just going to be Jerry, especially sure. for the Chief Williams. <clears throat> the boogeyman is real. Our violent crime <laughs> rates are through the roof. People, are, people are, are killing one another at a rate that we've not seen in a very long time. So to defund me, is, is really uh, disserving those communities of color because that's primarily what we're seeing. Is there a way for PD or the police departments or sheriff departments, if, if I may, Sheriff Owens, um, not respond to calls that are not necessary? Absolutely. So I'm certain in this conversation, we're gonna talk about reimagining or what does it look like if we don't respond to certain calls? I really need my folks, uh, my folks in uniform to be responding to those calls for service that are violent in nature or um, challenging as opposed to responding to a mental health call or, or a homeless call. So we are properly funded, uh, much like other law enforcement agencies in the country, we're having a challenge hiring and retaining people. Some mm -hmm. of it has to do with the rhetoric in social media. Some of it has to do with the job market. And, and, and why would you get yelled at, spat on, perhaps shot at, fight, do whatever when I can go work at Apple or work someplace else and make a lot of money and not have those dynamics. So we are properly funded. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And um, before I go to Director Ice, I just wanna put on the uh, floor for the context of this discussion. 
you know, it's very sad. Yesterday, we learned that a fourth police officer uh, in uh, D.C. that was involved in uh, the shooting of, uh, I mean, the, the uh, insurrection on January 6th has committed suicide. There's a lot of uh, uh, pressure on law enforcement. Uh, and sometimes I don't think the public at large, you know, I'm in the newspaper business now, but I, I don't think that the public at large understands the uh, tremendous trauma uh, that's also on law enforcement in this season. You know, uh, uh, we have almost two pandemics, one a COVID-19 pandemic, but then we have a pandemic of also uh, 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 violent white supremacy. The, the FBI says that the greatest domestic threat uh, to the United States right now is, is white supremacy. So, I, I, you know, for white supremacy is violent organizations, that is. Uh, so, uh, uh, Director Isom, uh, how do you see this from the uh, perspective of St. Louis? Uh, uh, are you getting adequate funding? And uh, the question that uh, Chief Williams raised was uh, how do we uh, recruit? Uh, adequate uh, uh, people to be in the police department when there's so much misinformation and disinformation and, and to some extent a campaign to almost um, undermine uh, the the quality and purpose of policing. Well, I mean, you always, no matter what um, profession or industry, you want to pay your people more. Um, they do good work and, and you want to pay them more. Uh, the question I think we have for us today is, um, as the chief said, and, and I think as the sheriff said, as mentioned as well, um, how do we, we really offload uh, those uh, activities and those calls that we all agree uh, should not be law enforcement, but law enforcement is directed to on a daily basis, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So I do believe that if we could transform our approach and provide alternative services, um, we have an adequate amount of policing to address the serious crimes uh, that we need to address and pay uh, a lot of attention to because it, it takes a lot of time and effort to do that, not only with presence, but follow up and investigation. So, you know, I, I think it's this process of really, as we talked about, reimagining a law enforcement and, and trying to figure out what is the, the proper mix um, that might result in uh, certain funds that are directed to traditional uh, law enforcement going into other areas. And that's not defunding the police. That's using an aspect of what the police department has traditionally done for another part of uh, city services, social services, or health services that will deal with that. Um, that takes a transition. So it's like, you know, which comes first, the yes. chicken or the egg? And so it's a process to, to get to that. Uh, thankfully, here we we are experiencing a significant decrease in violent crime, uh, un, unlike some other cities. But uh, certainly, if we were going up, the conversation probably would be a bit a bit different. Very good. Well, I'm glad to hear that things are uh, not out of control in uh, St. Louis. Uh, the thing is, it leads to the fourth question: What adjustments to policing policies and plans do you think are needed to address social problems that impact public safety? All three of you have already mentioned mental health situation. Uh, do you have any recommendations starting again with Sheriff Owens of what could be done uh, to improve policing policies that also impact the uh, uh, public safety, but also in the context of uh, the social problems that our society are facing? That's another good question. I think, you know, I think people really need to understand that law enforcement or sheriff's officers cannot bear, you know, bear this burden alone. We just right. cannot take on this social problem and, and, and defeat it. So we definitely need to have the help of the local, regional, state, federal government to help us provide resources so we can keep resources in these different social um, areas that need from mental health care, the homelessness and things of that nature, provide mo uh, monies and the personnel are going into these areas and help our people get back on their feet, help them get the, the health care or mental health they need to get be successful. You know, in college, we're trying to practice like to say uh, compassionate, professional law enforcement. So and we understand, you know, whether you're homeless, you have mental health issues, or whatever the case may be, we have to have that compassionate 
uh, when we deal with, be compassionate, we're dealing with everyone as well as had a professional law enforcement committee going forward. So I think if we do those things and get our local state and federal to help us provide more resources and money into other areas, I think it makes us be more successful. Very good. Uh, Chief Williams, uh, same question. Um, uh, are there any policies that you could recommend that how in reimagining policing that would deal with some of the increasing social problems that uh, uh, public policy may expect police to handle? So, so yet another loaded question again. So, so I almost want to pose another question. And sure, question go ahead. Is why, so, so why is it always on the backs of police that these social problems become ours? So we are, we are part of the solution, uh, but for everyone who's listening, the challenge is there are two entities that have 24 seven coverage, it's law enforcement and fire. So when things go bad at three o'clock in the morning, I don't have a mental health service that's gonna roll at three o'clock in the morning. And so we continue to pile on all these responsibilities to police. Um, the good and bad, bad dynamic of being in law enforcement is that we always figure out a solve for things. So if something happens, we're gonna figure out a solve. Um, it has been said, I, I've heard this three, four, five, six times in the last six months, You know, we didn't sign up to be mental health professionals yet. We are responsible for trying to create that balance when we come in contact with, with people with crisis intervention teams and other things. So we need our community members and social services to step up with us, not for us, with us. Um, I, I also wanna caution everyone on this uh, Zoom also, that if and when we do have crisis intervention teams rolling on calls, there may come a point in time where that crisis intervention team person is going to need a police officer because it's going sideways. So let's, so let's not think that the crisis intervention teams or mental health professionals are the solve all for things because we're still gonna have to get called in. But man, it would be wonderful to be able to have that kind of crisis person rolling at three and four o'clock in the morning and not have to have law enforcement respond and or respond um, kind of co collectively. But I do think it's a community's responsibility to, to lean in with us. And for so long, we've been the one sitting on the front lines and, and nobody is sitting with us. So I would challenge the mental health community behavioral health community, social service agencies, just to lean in with us so we can create a really good system for all of us in our communities. Thank you. Well, well Chief, I want to thank you for your counterpoint because uh, that is often not raised. Uh, it seems to me a lot of times uh, the police become the, uh, the last uh, point of, of, of consideration, but yet you're out, uh, out front for, before anybody else. And, and I think that um, dealing with reimagining police, it shouldn't just be on the police to reimagine. It should be the whole community has to be involved in reimagining uh, law enforcement, reimagining uh, public service, reimagining re public safety, uh, the services that are provided. You know, I think we are in a habit, I'm talking about society's in a habit, pointing the fingers at the police uh, every time something goes wrong rather than reaching out to the police to make sure things go right, uh, you, know, uh, you know, proactively, not just reactively. Uh, Director Isom, uh, in, in St. Louis, I know you've had a turnaround on some of the uh, uh, alleged police brutality issues. And uh, I know that the Black Lives Matter movement really got some of its impetus out of, out of Missouri, out of St. Louis, out of Ferguson, et cetera. But how do you see, uh, coming up now with uh, public policies, uh, Director, uh, that are more inclusive. In other words, what Chief Williamson just pointed out, not using police as just a scapegoat. Well, I think one of the things that have uh, come out of the movement here in, in St. Louis is to, to give community members more, more oversight and more input into the police department um, I stepped away from law enforcement for about eight years before I came back to uh, here as the public safety director. But um, what I realized as I was gone is that even if uh, you are doing good internal investigations, but the public doesn't trust your investigations, then what's the use of it? And so if we are uh, confident that we are policing ourselves, then why don't we open the door to the community to be a part of that process, uh, to allow them not only access, but also uh, the ability 
to give real oversight of substance. And so what we are doing here is uh, transforming the civilian oversight board to be truly community, but also put teeth in it so they have the ability to investigate, uh, review, give recommendations uh, consistent with what we believe a community oversight board will be. I believe that people in the end will be fair uh, to law enforcement uh, if we allow them in the door and uh, allow them the ability to have oversight over the police department. And that's the direction we're moving in. Um, thank you. Uh, I think all three of you gave an uh, excellent response uh, to what uh, the chief referred to as a loaded question. It was loaded. But uh, and uh, you gave great authentic answers uh, to that question. Thank you so much. Uh, which takes us to the next question. Uh, who should be assigned to manage the idea of reimagining public safety initiative in your department? And what role should community leaders play in this process? I think we touched on it, but I was a little bit more specific. So uh, Sheriff Owens, is there someone in your department that is in charge or is it more collective uh, from the leadership at the top of law enforcement to help uh, get the reimagining of police uh, not only initiated, but follow through with community leadership? Yeah, that's, I, I, I don't think that's such a loaded question this time. So I think maybe a little easier for us. Uh, for me, uh, being a first term sheriff and newly elected sheriff, I had to rebrand our agency. We've been doing the same thing for the last 50 plus years by any change. So I had to come in and re-image slash rebrand this agency. And to me, that started with me, re-imaging, rebranding. So by me starting it and then having a leadership team on board to make sure my mission statement and vision is seen for and it's getting out to the community was very important. But equ equally important for me was having that relationship with my community leaders and then having that conversation and buy-in from them. And I think that is what's making us be so successful. I created a, what we call a community engagement team here in Cobb County to specifically target our community, making sure we're getting all input, feedback, everything from our community uh, that can make us be successful to the extent that I even hired a new Hispanic liaison because Cobb County has the third largest Hispanic population in the Metro Atlanta area. So I knew we had to do something to bridge that gap between uh, the law enforcement community and the Hispanic community. So by doing that thing, getting everybody in that community input has been very good. So I think uh, to make it work, you got to have the public buy-in as well as you got to have your leadership team buy-in and getting the information out to the community in a positive light. And right from the beginning, not halfway through your, for me, for my term, you got to get it from day one. Good. Um, Chief Williams, um, would there be somebody assigned in your department to handle the reimagining or would you uh, be similar to what Sheriff Orange just stated about that the reimagining starts at the top and then to the rest of the department. So th thank you for that one. So I think reimagining policing is everyone's responsibility. It's the mayor's responsibility, it's council's responsibility, it's city management. So I'm a city manager form of government. I'm not a strong mayor. I answer to a city manager and he can hire or fire all department heads. So it takes a city manager's office and community involvement. Phoenix has had so many different community groups um, dating back to Sweet Lord, like 2010, 2007, but getting various community leaders involved also. I think the sheriff mentioned this. You have to have support from the department. So if the department is holding everything close to the vest, there's no way people are, people are going to be able to look in. So it does take management. It does take leadership. But I would also say that it's going to take the average patrol officer, someone who comes in contact with folks every day, who's the active representation of what law enforcement is, making sure we're accountable, making sure that we're sharing information, um, but definitely getting police oversight in, involved. So Phoenix is one of the largest cities that doesn't have police, excuse me, civilian oversight and council just established that um, just this year. So we're finally getting someone who is going to look at investigations, training, policies, procedures, and practices. Um, and in my opinion, all you can do is tell me how to be better. All you can do is help me identify gaps that maybe my 32 years in law enforcement, I'm not able to see because I've been involved in this game for as long as I have been. Thank you. Well, we, we appreciate your longevity and your leadership, Chief Williams, and your perspectives are, uh, are invaluable to other uh, law enforcement executives around the country, but also to the community at large. 
uh, I've noticed that uh, on this live stream, we not only have people from the law enforcement community listening, but we have people in the community, which is great. Uh, and hopefully everyone will gain insight about the importance of reimagining uh, police policies and practices. Uh, Director Isom, is there someone in your department or you would direct uh, uh, that would be in charge of the reimagining process? Well, I, I agree. I think it, it does involve the entire community, but to start the process, it, realistically, it has to rely on you know, city government to begin the process. So in here, um, we have a representative from the mayor's office and also a representative uh, from the police department who are working with uh, two organizations to develop a framework to engage the community around this discussion. Uh, one is the Center for Police Equity, which many people are familiar with in law enforcement, but here in St. Louis, as a re result of the Mike Brown incident, um, Forward Through Ferguson was formed. And so it will be a collaborative approach between the National Organization of Center for Police Equity and Forward Through Ferguson as we work through this issue with the community uh, to develop a blueprint for reimagining what uh, policing will be in St. Louis. Very good. Thank you. Uh, our next question is federal, state, and local governments are taking steps to transform policies and procedures in public safety. What are you doing to prepare frontline officers for the impending changes? And I think uh, all three of you have mentioned the importance of training, but specifically uh, your frontline officers, how they've been prepared for some of the uh, reimagination of policing in America. Uh, Sheriff Owens? Yeah, let me just start just real quickly and back up just a second, if I may. Sure. I think so the audience can kind of get a different perspective of a little bit of differences between the police and sheriff's, I mean, insurance office. When you say you hear the chief says she may have to go through the city council or through the mayor and the director may say the same thing. See, the sheriff does not have to do that. The sheriff is an elected official. So I am the CEO of this organization. And a lot of decisions that's made is strictly on my show when I work for the, for the people. And I don't answer to the city council or mayor or board of commissioners. The only thing they do for the most of the sheriffs right now is handling the budget for them. So we are a little different in that aspect. So that's so to get a perspective why I say it has to start with me, as they say right. they have to start with the city government. I right. am that person for the sheriff's office. So that's where it starts with me. But to get into your second question, I think as we touched on, I think mandatory training is key. Uh, I think for me, what I'm doing at my agency at passive training is taking a big investment in technology, trying to most find the best technology that's out there to make our, um, our deputies most equipped with that technology, which hopefully will uh, deter some of the uh, violent situations we're running into where we invest in brand new body cameras, tasers, drones. That way we can have drones come in and even answer some of these as we like to see less serious calls as Chief pointed out and directed it as well. I think those things are good initiatives we're looking into to really get our deputies and officers in high crime areas and maybe some of these drones can pick up some of these smaller um, nuisance calls as we like to call them sometimes so we can get manpower where it really needs to be. And what else I think I do in that to make it a little better for our guys is, you know, you gotta get out at least get out and, and meet our deputies and our officers Go to some of these shift meetings. I want to hear from them. They can tell me some things I only see from behind my desk, but I can see in person by talking to them. Give me a better picture of what they may need to do their job better in regards to technology. And I think that's something that we're doing here. I think it's been successful. It's going to make us more successful in the future. Uh, before we move on, uh, Sheriff Hunt, can you also comment on the recruitment? Are you able to find uh, the talent and the commitment of uh, men and women, uh, particularly from uh, communities of color in Cobb County that are willing to join and serve the Sheriff's Department? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I remember when uh, someone talked about it earlier. Uh, I am very fortunate currently. I have over 250 people on the waiting list to be hired for Cobb County Sheriff's Office. Uh, when I first got in office, I did a like what I call, like, call a blitz. I mean, I hit all the local radio stations. I hit all my HBCUs in the Atlanta area. And I did uh, some TV spots. I put billboards up. And I went into neighborhoods of color, specifically targeting those individuals. I wanted to make sure that I had a diverse workforce and educated workforce. So I hit that very hard. 
And, and I tell everyone as today that, you know, Cobb County is going to be one of the most diverse, highly educated departments in the Metro Atlanta area. So we're looking for those individuals. And, I'm, and we play radio spots once a week, build boards around the county. So right now we have over 200 plus on the waiting list for our, for our agency to be hired. Um, we probably got like 41 vacancies now. So, but uh, we're going to fill those very soon. So right now our recruiting efforts is going to very well. Well, c congratulations on the success of, of your efforts and success of your leadership. Uh, Chief Williams, uh, how are you preparing officers, uh, your frontline officers uh, in, in uh, Phoenix? So, so let's go back to the previous question about the policies and, and procedures. I am not one to think that all because I say it means that it's going to happen. You do have to follow that up. Of course. So what we do is when we make adjustments or changes in policy, I'm messaging via video and or in person to lieutenants and sergeants about the why for the change. Oftentimes cops, cops just get annoyed when you change something just in general, but if you give them the why behind it, it makes more sense and it's much more clear to them. Um, so me and my number two, we go face to face with the uh, lieutenants and sergeants. I push out emails or PDTV videos. We have mandatory trainings for everyone in the department, either online or in person. For the most part, a lot of those have been online for people just to gather and understand the information. And we have constant legal briefs that gets pushed out to our employees. Uh, one thing that we started a few months because we realized a gap in training on, on the patrol level. So I have seven different precincts and all seven kind of operate some, at times as their own little world. So in order to make sure we're standardizing training, we have what's called organized briefing training. So we push out different training updates, different policy updates once a month, and everyone is required to look at that um, to standardize that training model. Now, the sheriff mentioned something that I, that I think sometimes we take for granted. Not every agency has body-worn cameras. That's a problem. Two, not every agency has a policy on what to share in body-worn cameras or the time frame that you're going to push out information. Um, and also, not every agency has the proper messaging for pushing out those videos. Now, I can give you a couple of examples, and I know, Dr. Chavis, I'm, I'm going off script, but I, I no, think no, I'm not No, this is good. This is good. You're, 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 right, on, you're so, right on script. Don't worry. So we can, we can have folks put on a body-worn camera, but and, and I don't know how many other chiefs and or sheriffs or directors are on this, but sometimes your officers forget that they're wearing a dog on body-worn camera. And they say stupid stuff and they do stupid stuff, put the body one camera video on. So, so how does your department or agency find those before the media does? Because if the media finds it first, trust me, it's not going to end well for you, chief, sheriff, director, anybody. So, so do you have a, a policy for reviewing those type of videos or reviewing any use of force? And then what do you do with that once you get it? Um, I, 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 I know for a fact Phoenix had some identified gaps that were brought to us by the media on one side by ourselves on another side. So what we've done because, because I'm so large is that we've signed assigned a sergeant in each of our precincts to review body worn camera footage on any use of force. And if it's wrong, they need to call it wrong and then they need to push it up the chain to make sure we're all aware of it. Or if there's a need for training, they need to identify that too. So, so I think it's one thing to put a body worn camera on a police officer or a law enforcement officer. It's another thing to have the policies, procedures, practices, training to govern, govern that body-worn camera video. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. You gave a very thorough and, and specific uh, example uh, and answer. Thank you, Chief. Um, Director Isom, uh, in these um, attempts now to transform policies and procedures, and you've already indicated that uh, St. Louis is on the way with that, but do you have a... Um, how does that impact your frontline officers? Is there a special training for the new innovations, whether they're technological innovations or human resource, you know, the changes in, in who hire, the hiring patterns of many police departments is changing? Well, I, I, I certainly don't have the, the knowledge of, of the training of St. Louis police officers since I've uh, just returned that, that the chief has and the, and the sheriff okay. since they've been been involved, so I'm not going to pretend that I I know the details of the training. But what I will say is that um, there has been a regional conversation about having a regional police academy. Uh, both St. Louis City and St. Louis County uh, academies are becoming end of life, and so out of that conversation, 
we're we're not just talking about the building. We're talking about a new building and a new curriculum as well. And so, um, you know, no particulars, but I, there is a, a community conversation around what should a new regional academy look like, but also what should new regional curriculum look like as well. That would be centered around a lot of the things that we're talking about here today. Okay, great. Um, the next question, and all these questions sort of lead into the subsequent question. Uh, should police academy training, this is even before the uh, officer becomes a, uh, and takes the Oval Office, should police academy trainings be revamped to emphasize a paradigm of police as guardians instead of as warriors? Uh, Chief Owens. That, that, I, I want to say that's a loaded question for me. Yeah. And I want to say that because, you know, being a 30 year military guy, you always taught to be a warrior, and that's what you taught to keep you to survive on the battlefield. But what I try to do as, as newly elected sheriff is not to bring that military, uh, and I do it on, on tension into the sheriff's office so we don't be seen as a militaristic organization. However, the discipline and training that comes with it, I think, is, is critically important. We have to instill that into our officers and or deputies while they're going to train. So we need to revamp some of our training methodologies and um, academies, no doubt about it. I think our academy should be um, certified and accredited um, and receive that accreditation. So we know we're teaching all our um, young deputies and officers um, industry standards and, and the testing procedures are adequate. And then making sure that we're also getting the right people in those academies, making sure we got things even before they walk through the door, they're being tested correctly psychological exam, polygraphs, uh, things of that nature, to make sure we're getting the right students in the first place come through those doors. But once they get in the door, through those doors, train them correctly and, and, and actually got to have some compassion in that training, which I stated a little earlier, have some compassion, how we treat everyone. Um, and I think that's going to eventually make it better for all these guys and when they come out as kind of be uh, great deputies and officers. Very good, very good. Um, in terms of um, Chief Williams, how do you see this? As we discuss reimagining policing, the paradigm of police being the guardians or, or servants of the community versus the warriors or the enforcers of the community. Uh, how are you handling uh, the issue of uh, a paradigm shift of how policing is defined, looked, or its image, or its branding? So uh, thank you for that question. I, I do believe that your peace officer certification bodies have the responsibility to, of revamping curriculum. To the sheriff's point, um, Arizona Post, that's our, our standard, uh, literally took the entire curriculum, readjusted it, changed it, uh, added in more de-escalation practices, took out that piece that we're not in a war zone anymore. Urban policing is very different than someone in the military. But, so we're really putting that in the mix. But we also have to understand, and, and we learned this probably the hard way, is that this younger generation doesn't communicate the way we all communicate. So I'm gonna presume everybody on the call, at least I, I, I'm in my fifties. So how we <laughs> communicated and how we grew up is very different than this other generation. I know D Director Iverson, you're probably like way younger, but I'll leave that alone. Um, anyways, so, so, we, so we literally have to teach this younger generation how to communicate without texting with, without being on a social media device to actually engage with people. Um, and from my generation, that, that was just something that was so simple that was ingrained in us. When you met someone, you shook their hand, you made eye contact, you're, you're practicing listening skills. So we're really working hard on that piece. Um, I, I also think that when we have academies, either during the academy, post-academy, that we have community members come in and speak from their perspective to those new officers that are hitting the streets. So, so we, we have our young officers in the precincts engage with different community members, either Black Watch leaders, uh, proactive neighborhood patrol folks, or just community folks that want to come in and talk to them about how they wish to be policed and how it looks from their eyes. So I think it's critical to have uh, your community members involved as well, but it does start with post. It continues with the current agency and it should follow with the community as well as everyone who's involved in the field training process really has to reiterate 
that notion that everyone should go home at the end of the day, including the community members. You need to go home at the end of the day, community members, and to whatever extent we can really lift up that sanctity of life, I think it's critical. I, I haven't figured it all out, so I'm, I'm not saying that Phoenix PD has it figured out, uh, but we do have policies, procedures, and practices that govern that, that we really work on um, continuous training with our employees to include the new employees. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, how is the uh, recruitment uh, in the academy? Is it diverse? Does it reflect the diversity of Phoenix? You know, Arizona is one of these states, one of the fastest growing, well, Phoenix is one of the fastest growing cities in the, in the United States, but it's also uh, one of the most diverse cities, uh, ethnic uh, and racially speaking. Does your uh, recruitment reflect uh, the, 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 the demographic changes and in, 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 I won't call it the new America, I would say the transforming right. America, demographically. Right. So I, I, I would love to say I have the secret sauce and I figured it out and my police department absolutely mirrors the community that I serve. I'd be lying if I said that though. So, so we have more women coming in. I am seeing more people of color but that doesn't translate to us looking exactly the way that the community looks. And, and truth be told, I don't know if Director Isom and the sheriff have the same challenge. I'm losing some of those younger kids because of the defund movement, the pressures of policing. Um, someone mentioned it in, in the chat too, that the trauma that is imposed on law enforcement officers, I've had to increase my both peer support and employee assistance unit just to mitigate and manage a lot of the trauma um, and different scenarios that my officers faced during um, 20 uh, that, that were just horrendous. And I, and I have folks literally going home every night trying to second guess whether or not I'm gonna come back to work. And a lot of those are some of my kids of color and some of the women that I have coming through the doors also. So our recruitment efforts are really pushing, getting into churches, getting into fraternities and sororities, getting into business groups to have business folks and community members feed us the people who look more like us versus the white male officers that I have. Great. Well, again, we're having this discussion in the context of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. And I'm looking at a lot of the social media responses to this live stream. And people are surprised, uh, Chief and Sheriff and Director, that you three are so candid, so authentic, so honest. And that, that's, I don't know why they're surprised. That's why we have you, because we knew that you would. Uh, uh, speak truth uh, to power and speak truth to the community. Because a lot of times um, the community doesn't feel that they're getting uh, the truth. And uh, so we appreciate your candor. Uh, Director Isom, uh, similarly, um, uh, you mentioned it uh, in recruitment in the St. Louis uh, area. Uh, are you finding post uh, Ferguson, uh, people are seeing law enforcement uh, uh, a, a, as an opportunity to serve the community. Um, just talk a little bit about that from your perspective, what, what you've seen on the ground. I think we're experiencing similar things across the nation in, in terms of policing as the chief indicated. Um, we have been able to, to keep up with attrition on the St. Louis Police Department, but we have had a considerable amount of turnover, especially at the uh, lower end of the police department, the, the one to four year category of tenure. And so um, we're, we're really trying to, as all police departments, invest in mental health and socialize in our officers as they come on to help them deal with the stress and the conflict and support them. Um, but, but certainly uh, we are, are feeling the strains also of, of turnover. Uh, in, in terms of diversity, um, we, we are sort of holding firm. We don't completely reflect uh, the numbers in the city of St. Louis, um, but um, you know, the numbers are pretty much split 50-50 here in St. Louis and about 30% of our department is African-American. Um, we're always challenged with getting um, other more diverse communities within the police department and more women uh, is always a challenge, but um, yeah, like every police department, we're, we're working towards trying to retain officers and uh, recruit a more diverse group of officers to come on the police department. Th thank you uh, very much. Uh, Chief Williams mentioned something that I think is very important before we uh, conclude this discussion, and that is how young people, how Generation Z, 
how millennials see uh, law enforcement today. Uh, in light of everything that's going on in the last 12 months in America, uh, in light of um, some of the tensions uh, in some of the other major cities uh, where, you know, there's some serious uh, social problems uh, facing our community in terms of poverty, in terms of disenfranchisement, uh, disillusionment. I mean, it's a long list of things. Um, for example, I'm just reading now that um, there are about 6 million people who are facing evictions. Well, law enforcement are going to have to uh, enforce those uh, evictions. And so here we go again. Uh, but I do want to um, ask all three of you, in particular, uh, how are you outreaching to Generation Z and millennials? In other words, uh, young brothers and sisters under 30, uh, under 20, how, how are we reaching them with, with your messaging? I'll start with uh, Sheriff Owens first. That's a good question. Uh, I think you have to reach them where we where we know they are, and that's through these social media contacts. That's Instagram, Facebook, different type of apps, uh, TikTok, Twitter, wherever they own now. We got to find a way to meet these young individuals and talk to them. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's important for us to know what they are on and their social media platforms, so we get on and try to uh, have a conversation to talk to them. But you said something, uh, and I may back up. That I think it's critically important. This may affect me more so than the chief and director, <clears throat> excuse me, it's these evictions. Uh, these evictions, when these um, rooms end and are ending in my county, we may be putting out anywhere between 40 to 60,000 people be put out of their homes, you know, and that's something that's a job that the sheriff's office is responsible. That's one of our mandates. That's something that we're responsible for doing. And so for what we're doing, uh, of course, we know that's going to happen, unfortunately. So what we're trying to do for my agency is I've got with the community leaders, local businesses, and trying to come up with ways we can help our individuals who we know we have to put out by even getting gift cards, getting hope, um, one and two, three night hotel stays, pods where they put their uh, their belongings in. So we sat down the street. Uh, we're trying to find ways to try to do whatever we can to ease this unfortunate burden that may uh, be forced upon them because of this this issue. So, but that there is going to be a pandemic, another pandemic. I can tell you, in the Metro Atlanta area is going to be running rapid in the next few weeks. You're talking about putting hundreds of thousands of people out of their homes to include businesses as well uh, on the side of the street. And that comes from us from the sheriff's office uh, is our responsibility. And that makes us not good, look good in, in, in our community views neither, but we have to, that's not our, we have to do that. You imagine you see a five-year-old kid, seeing a sheriff deputy uh, unloading their stuff and help, well not, we don't actually do it ourselves, but have them stand up, they move their stuff out and put them inside the home with the the image this child has, the last one he or she has, is this law enforcement official put me and mom and dad out this house. Now we have nowhere to go. So we're trying to do things, trying to curb the image, do things for those families that we have to evict them, give them some places to stay for a few nights, give them gift cards so they can go buy groceries and food and have mother monies. So this thing here is very serious issue. I know it, uh, Atlanta's not gonna be the only place it has, but I can tell you it's gonna be a bad thing for us. I understand. Well, that's why we're discussing it, you know. Hopefully, um, uh, well, let me put this, uh, Sheriff. It's my understanding that uh, 47 to $48 billion was already allocated by the Congress uh, to pay off some of these uh, back rents, to pay off the, uh, the landlords, so that the landlords would be uh, uh, satisfied. But a lot of the money has been held up at the state level. Uh, and so um, that, that's just terrible that the weight of these evictions are going to come, again, disproportionate on communities of color because of um, maybe it's the partisan divide between Democrats and Republicans or just outright, because, you know, some states are also denying uh, Medicaid and Medicare to their uh, uh, citizens. So it, it is, uh, but once again, you made the point, it's going to fall on the law enforcement. Uh, to enforce the law. Uh, and I just think that um, if there was any way to avert this crisis, uh, this new pandemic, as you describe it, uh, we should do everything in our power to try to uh, 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 divert uh, uh, the ultimate uh, put out uh, of, of people's property and their lives uh, without any shelter at all. You're right, it's going to cause a big problem. Yeah, I like to lose this one term on this, and that'd be for me. But, you know, we say it's lawful. But it sure is awful just to people when you know they have nowhere else to go. 
Yes, I like that. Uh, Chief Williams is a good segue. I see you raising your hands up, you know. Uh, this well, cause is Because I'm up here having church trying to tell the sheriff preach because he, he, he identified something as I'm riding into work today and I'm listening on the radio about the whole eviction piece. Once again, law enforcement are the bad guys. And to the sheriff's point, that three-year-old, five-year-old, seven-year-old that's been sitting home with, with their grandma or auntie or whomever they're living with, they're going to have this constant image that's negative of what law enforcement did to their family. So I, I do want to segue back to the um, millennial question or the yes. young person question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's incumbent upon police agencies and police depart departments to get them involved early. So we have an explorer program that young people can get involved with. Typically, I don't have African Americans on that. Um, I have a, a, an amazing uh, public affairs or, or community specialist. Her name is Nikki Hicks, and she got me prepared for today. So shout out to Nikki Hicks. She's awesome. She rocks. Uh, she, she identifies with this group and has contact with them. We have millennial academies where we're inviting young people into the academy experience where they spend three, four hours with our training staff and, and are there and we're there to answer any questions that they may have. But to the degree that, that you have a public information bureau, uh, I'm fortunate to have an entire bureau that pushes out information, gets me ready for press conferences, those kind of things. Quite a few of those kids is what I'm gonna call them, uh, are, are part of my social media piece. So I have 20 year olds pushing out information that work for the police department. And I would also suggest that if I, if you have a relationship with an academic institution, uh, we were drowning in social media in 2019 because of some critical incidents. We had uh, the Facebook issue and then the shoplifting incident. We were drowning in social media. Right. So we invited in Arizona State University for free and the kids got credit to come in and completely and totally revamp our social media platform to give us suggestions and ideas. So I think it's important for us to invite young folks in to help us fix things that some of us uh, don't know how to fix because we can't see things that way. Uh, but find those folks and those entities to invite those kids in so that they can see from the ground up what's going on, I think is gonna create some great dynamics. Yeah, thank you, Chief. Um, Director Isom. Uh, how are you reaching out to millennials and Generation Z uh, in St. Louis? I think as was indicated, um, we're using social media and some of the, the traditional ways in which we engage younger people. But I think for here in St. Louis, um, the biggest avenue is to work through existing community organizations um, to be present uh, when they have events, um, uh, different types of activities. Um, we, we really press upon our captains and our districts to really be engaged and aware of opportunities really to engage young people in sort of non-enforcement activities, um, whether it's a, a picnic or a community event, um, a, a basketball game, a baseball game. Uh, those are the ways in which you, know, you can connect with people in a non-threatening way uh, and, and get them to understand that you know, the, the, the police should be a person you go to when you're in need of help, uh, not um, someone you should be afraid of. And so I think the police department is doing a really good job of doing that, meeting young people in the communities where they live. Thank you very much. Um, so, one so question. Dr. Chavis, can I? Yes. I'm sorry, can I add one more thing, please? Of course. Um, I, I, I think the sheriff mentioned this. Sometimes you have to meet the kids where they are. So engaging them in sports activities, we have a, a program that's called FIT, where we have men of color who are engaging high school kids in the gym, on the football field. We also have a great partnership that we established during last year with the Arizona Cardinals, where they've sponsored a couple of kind of mini camps, if you will, where the kids are outside, flag football, throwing balls, all kinds of things. So if you can meet the kids at something that interests them, I think that's a really good start and then secondly, um, when I was a police chief in Oxnard, California, two sergeants came up with a program that would funnel kids in at the high school level, teach them how to build wrap cars, um, do different mechanical things with vehicles and other things, and it was called drag. So we brought that program here when I came to Phoenix, and we're engaging high schoolers that, that can't play sports, that aren't, you know, can't play an instrument, they're not in drama, but, but they, they have this knack where they can, they can paint, they can wrap cars, they, they have this, this mechanical mind. 
Um, and I think meeting kids and that engagement to the director's point, meeting them in a non-enforcement activity is a great example for Phoenix. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from our audience and it's about, uh, it's, uh, related to the reach out to millennials and Generation Z. Uh, and that is how are we handling youth diversionary programs where we divert young people from uh, the, the established criminal justice system into other programs uh, to divert. Um, I'll, I'll start with uh, Sheriff Owens. Uh, how are diversion programs uh, reaching young people in uh, Cobb County? We have a couple of different um, local diversion programs in place. I think they work very effectively now. Though the goals of those agencies and programs are to get kids into the program, of course, first and give them avenues of escape to become better what they are. Avenues from education platforms to athletic platforms, almost like a, uh, a power program, the police athletic league. We have also coordinations with our professional, um, our professional uh, team, NFL teams here, the Falcons. We have uh, deals with the Braves, Atlanta United to work in those programs as well, to get another outlet to get out there, to give them um, another opportunity to do something else versus get put into the system, which is what we don't want them to do. So we have a couple of programs out there that's working very well right now. Um, it's kind of, they're actually being very well funded by those uh, professional organizations as well. So that's the avenue we're using currently to um, divert some of these kids from going down that path they've been going down. Right, uh, and just let me put this question before I go, uh, thank you, Chair uh, Vaughn, before I go to Chief Williams. The Children's Defense Fund uh, issued a report uh, a couple of months ago about the demographic changes in the public school system. And we know that in many uh, states and many communities, unfortunately, uh, the public schools have served as almost a pipeline to juvenile justice rather than a pipeline to college or to some meaningful experience. We're disproportionately expelled, we're disproportionately uh, um, cited as uh, non uh, uh, that, that we can't be educated, we need to be institutionalized. Uh, but the report for the Children's Defense Fund for the first time, uh, Sheriff Owens, uh, Chief Williams, and uh, Director Eisen has reported that the majority of young people in public schools under 18 today are already come from communities of color. And so the demographic changes in America are changing more rapidly than even the demographicals that uh, demographers had predicted. They said by 2030, 2040. But as far as young people, that demographic shift has already changed. So the reason why I'm putting this question in context, if it's true that in the school systems around America, that increasingly these uh, classrooms are gonna be filled with children of color, uh, how then do we make sure that we, the schools, those systems are not feeder programs for the prison system? That's what I'm trying to get to. Um, uh, Chief, and then I'll come back to you at the end, uh, uh, Sheriff Owens, but Chief Williams, how, how are you dealing with this intersection between schools and law enforcement? So, so, I, so I think we deal with it by not identifying a kid with a behavior problem as criminal. That's not the law enforcement agency necessarily doing that. That is a school system. So, so then yes. again, we're giving all the responsibility back to the police officers when the principal, the guidance counselor, the disciplinarian or whomever it is in the, in the school system is saying that this kid is a problem and then labeling them and then they're acting and reacting to that label and then it becomes an issue and then they call law enforcement. So I, I, I think that the schools have the responsibility to help those in power uh, understand the difference between a behavior issue and a crime as well as law enforcement officers. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, and I'm probably not supposed to say this on the Zoom, but you know, I get in trouble all the time anyway. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I'm necessarily a fan of having school resource officers in school, and let me articulate this. If the law enforcement person isn't there and it's just a behavioral issue, is a school still going to be apt to pick up the phone and call law enforcement? So, so I, I think we really need to rethink what that looks like. Uh, I will say that uh, my son, so I have adult kids, 27 and 28. My uh, oldest son in, in school was identified as a problem. 
because he was highly intellectual. School was very easy for him. He, he wasn't in the rice placement. He should have been moved up. Um, but the teacher wanted to label him as his problem person and we weren't having it. But how many kids out there have parents like us who were proactive to identify and make sure that he got what he needed as opposed to becoming labeled? So I, I think that all trickles down in education and training. I know here in Phoenix, we have a couple of different programs, our PAL program, Police Activities League, um, our wake up clubs help kids not to become those feeders. And then just, just on his own, I have a Sergeant, we call him Memo, uh, but he's Sergeant Arubala that came up with a program called Success with Effort and Training, where he gets those kids who've been identified as a problem and gives them activities and gives them a, a platform and a voice and we're not feeding into the school and prison pipeline. So once again, Dr. Chavis, I think this involves the entire system versus yeah. just law enforcement, um, as, as well as the, those judges who also impose sentencing, perhaps imposing sentencing to work with law enforcement and different programs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Isom, um, how uh, diversionary programs working uh, in the St. Louis area and how are you dealing with the uh, changing demographics of the school system population in St. Louis? In other words, the intersection between law enforcement and public schools. Well, we have a, a number of different levels of diversion here in the city of St. Louis. Uh, certainly we have our law enforcement agencies who are working with young people around PAL and other um, programs within the police department. But we also, through our circuit attorney office, Kim Gardner, she has an extensive network of community partners where she can divert cases um, that would normally be issued and taken through the justice system. Um, she has a diversion program there. We also, within our corrections facility, have a program called Relink for individuals who are um, on charges but released uh, back into the community to have caseworkers who try to uh, manage uh, those detainees and those people who are on charges to see if we can move them, you know, so, to, to sort of pro-social activities. And so um, we have a, a number of different layers in the system, both from the police department to the uh, district attorney's office to our uh, jail when people are released to try to divert people into positive activities. But in terms of the school system, I think it's really important that police departments establish what is your role in terms of managing and discipline kids who are involved in activities inside the school. Uh, when I grew up, if you did something wrong, uh, the principal and the teacher dealt with that issue inside the school. They didn't call the police because there was a minor fight or disturbance inside the school. That was something that, um, you know, they handled in the normal course of school operations, understanding that kids are growing and learning and maturing. And that's part of the process of educating people in school. It's not the process of using law enforcement to enforce discipline within a school. So I think it's really about establishing, at least from the police department, um, what is our role in terms of, of uh, school discipline and management and we have the discretion in minor cases not to be involved in those situations and say, no, this is a school matter. This is not a police matter. And so I, that, is, that is my approach and my philosophy uh, in terms of uh, discipline and other issues that might happen in a school and then the police are called. Very good. Um, thank you. Uh, Chair Barnes, um, I know I saw you raise your eyebrows. <laughs> I wanna give you an opportunity to weigh in on um, these diversionary programs and the change in demographics. Uh, Cobb County, again, is one of those counties that the Children's Defense Fund cited as the rapid demographic changes. Uh, how, how are you handling the intersection between police and the school system? Well, Cobb a little different, as you probably well know, that um, in, inside our school system, the Cobb County uh, Board of Education had their own school police. So basically, the police nor the um, sheriff's office really have no workings inside the schools for uh, law enforcement services per se. So the school system has their own police department. So they handle everything within their, um, the school system. Um, but I, you know, if we, and I think we all know that once, you know, the principal, whoever the principal is at that school is kind of 
uh, is the person, he is the chief law enforcement executive for that, for that school. So 99.9% of the time decision they're going to make is, is what's going to happen. And so I think there got to be a separate, uh, a separation between that. I know uh, a great chief in Phoenix made mention about her, uh, her thoughts about uh, having um, law enforcement schools. I have some, some similar thoughts as well. That uh, is that appropriate use uh, of those officers being in school. Uh, we have principals, vice principals, counselors, and things should hopefully be the house on those instances in those schools. But uh, that's a big conversation here in Cobb County, across, and of course across the United States of removing law enforcement officials of being in school. So we have to really look at that very hard. So I, I agree with both the director, his comments, as well the chief. I just think we got to look at it from a, a holistic point of view and see what's going to be best for our children going forward. Thank you. Well, as I look at the clock, we, we have about four minutes left. And I would like to ask each of our panelists uh, for their final uh, comments uh, on the question of reimagining police policies and practices. Uh, Chief, your final comments. Well, I'm assuming you're talking to me, so I'm going to go first. Since you hit me first, this is share points. So yes. um, I think that. Uh, the great part of this conversation, I think, was, as you said earlier, the, the open dialogue and the frankness uh, yes. about the, the chief and the director. Uh, I think we all, and we take in, into new leadership roles, specifically talking about myself, maybe the director since he just came back uh, to um, St. Louis. We have to look at what we're walking into. Uh, I, you know, I ran this campaign and I won on what I can like to say, truth, trust, and transparency. And those are things we got to bring back to our agencies and our offices and once we come back into the fold and leading those into the future. So I think as we do that, that'll help us re, uh, re-image, rebrand, and, and get our agency and our department going down the right path. I think we gotta, uh, again, I think training is key. I think having um, good technology sound base applications is key. Um, having uh, good sound policies and procedures that's, uh, that, uh, that meets industry standards and for us, uh, and even being accredited, you know, for us, for sheriff's officers, you want to be triple crown rated. You want to get accredited in several different uh, platforms. So everyone at your agency uh, is, is doing everything with an entry stance across the United States. So those are things I think is critically important. And then the other thing is having that community buy-in and having that community relationship and keeping your community involved in what you do. And I think when you do that, I think that makes us an overall better agency and or department going forward. Thank you, Sheriff. Chief Williams. So, so ditto everything that the sheriff said, I mean, to be honest with you, but I, but I think it also takes a, a police executive who understands that policing is always evolving, that understands the wrongs that have been placed on different members of our communities at the hand of law enforcement. A whole lot of us sitting on this call that are police chiefs and sheriffs right now, you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago, we wouldn't have been in our position. So really capitalize on our experiences, on our lenses, on our ability to listen to our community members, while at the same time being unafraid to say when we mess up or when we don't get it right. We don't get it right, just say you don't you didn't get it right and figure out those different methodologies to fix it. Are we perfect? No. Will we ever be perfect? No, because we have human beings. But to the sheriff's point, policies, procedures, practices, communication, engagement, um, engagement with whomever your elected officials may be as well is, is critical also. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to talk. Thank you, Chief Williams. Director Isom. I think based on this conversation, um, everyone in St. Louis and around the nation should be excited that um, law enforcement and communities are really doing a, a critical analysis of where we are and where we need to be in policing in the future. I think in, in three different areas are very important is who we are bringing on police departments and what we are asking them to do. And then the second uh, thing that we really need to look at is this uh, 24 hour, seven days a week infrastructure for crisis response. I think we've mentioned that before. How do we build that infrastructure where um, mental health, health professionals, social services, and either, even other uh, city services can respond to communities' needs um, 24 hours a day. And then that last part that everyone is working on, what is the proper 
oversight role of communities. And that will be an ongoing discussion, but I believe that we're on the right page and, and we're moving in the right direction. Well, th thank you, um, Director Daniel Isom, uh, the Director of Public Safety of St. Louis, Missouri. Thank you, uh, Chief Jerry L. Williams, the Chief of Police of Phoenix, Arizona. And thank you, uh, Sheriff Craig Owens, Sheriff Cap County, Georgia. I'm Benjamin F. Chavis, Jr. On behalf of the National Newspaper Publishers Association, on behalf of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, thank you for listening. That concludes our session. Thank you all for your participation. Thank you, Doc. Have a great afternoon. Very good.